So I don't know if you've noticed, but egg prices are going through the roof. And they say it's because chickens all over the country are dying from a new avian flu. So what does that mean? I mean, do we need to be worried about that? What does it mean for us as humans? What does it mean for other birds and other animals? Let's talk about it. I'm Dr. Patrick Jones from the Home Herbalist School of Botanical Medicine. And uh, in addition to being a clinical herbalist and a naturopath, I also uh, was a veterinarian for over 30 years. Uh, did a lot of work in the poultry industry, a lot of work in the swine industry, a lot of work in, you know, beef cattle and dairy cattle and, I mean, just about everything, dogs and cats and chickens and parakeets and whatever. So <laughs> anyway, a lot of experience with these kinds of issues. Um, and uh, let's talk about this new avian influenza. So it's a type A uh, H5N1 avian influenza. And uh, what does that even mean? Well, first of all, what's an influenza? So an influenza is a virus, right? You've heard of the flu. The flu is short for influenza, all right? And uh, influenzas tend to be pretty host specific. So human influenzas you know, tend to only affect humans and avian influenzas tend to only do birds and swine flus only do the pigs, you know, and everybody's got one. There's a new canine flu that came out a few years ago that's, you know, restricted to dogs. But sometimes um, those, uh, those flus can mutate and suddenly they're able to infect other species. All right. And so um, with this avian influenza that we've got currently, this type A uh, H5N1 that we're wrestling with, it's getting into milk cows and it's getting into humans, okay? And uh, the way it's spread is by, you know, respiratory little droplets of uh, vapor from the lungs of an infected bird or from the feces of an infected bird uh, or from kissing an infected bird on the lips. You want to be careful about that. Uh, hard to find their lips. But anyway, uh, <laughs> that's how you, it can be transmitted. And it comes from wild populations of birds, okay? And so let's talk a little bit about that uh, first. So it's, it's very common in wild populations of birds, but it has a vastly lower mortality rate and a, and a much lower severity. You know, morbidity and mortality are both a lot lower in wild birds than they are in commercial chickens. Well, why is that? Well, it's because ducks and other birds in the wild are living the way they're supposed to live. You know, they're eating all natural diets that are very varied, all kinds of different plants, all kinds of bugs and snails and happy things that ducks like to eat and other birds. Uh, they get lots of exercise. They have an abundance of fresh air and sunshine. They're, they're living the way a bird is supposed to live. And so even though the flu this flu is is common in those populations, they're not dying from it in, in high numbers. You know, they get a little sick, they feel a little lousy for a few days, and they get better, okay? And the other thing that happens in wild populations is if you do get really sick and die, guess what? You don't make any babies, and your genes uh, don't get transmitted to your offspring. But if you live, because you have a good immune system and you're sort of naturally resistant to this flu and it's not going to be a big deal for you, you live and you do make babies and you do pass on those genes. And so the population is constantly being subjected to natural selective forces and you have a much healthier, more robust, more resistant population. Now, contrast that with chickens in, you know, an egg producing uh, operation. You know, those birds oftentimes are kept in little cages about this big. And often there's a couple of birds in that little cage and they're stacked as far as you can see in that big barn. Uh, so they're all this far away from another bird. Uh, they have no exercise. They have lousy ventilation in a lot of cases. Um, they have almost no light. You know, there's a little light bulb up in the ceiling that just barely 
shines for a very specified number of hours a day because that affects the pineal gland of the bird. So she lays eggs at a higher rate, you know, and anyway, that all gets complicated with chicken neurology. Uh, but the fact is that the, the ventilation, sanitation, diet, and exercise of those birds is lousy. It's lousy, okay? They're eating food that's specially selected and designed to maximize egg production, right? Or if it's a, a meat bird, to maximize meat production, right? They're not getting any green grass or dandelions or, you know, the hundred other weeds that they ought to be eating if they lived on a nice pasture. They're not getting any bugs, right? They're getting cracked corn and, and prepared pellets and meal uh, that are nothing like their natural diet, okay? And so when they get sick, first of all, they're really stressed, right? And so that affects the immune system and they're not getting anything they need and that affects the immune system. And when a commercial poultry operation gets really impacted by a serious disease, they do what's called a depop repop, depopulation repopulation. They cull the whole flock, kill them all, get them out of here, sanitize the building and bring in some more birds, okay? And so, the effect of that is that you're not getting any genetic <laughs> transfer of good traits into the next bunch of birds, right? And so, uh, you know, whether you could have had 20% of those birds or 80% of them that were real healthy and doing just fine with this silly little flu that didn't bother them very much, you know, maybe they're sneezing a little bit for a few days, but because of the, you know, the instance of the disease in the flock, they kill everybody, healthy or sick, right? Depop, repop, clean up, fill, fill, you start it again. They do the same thing with swine. If they get a serious pig disease, depop, repop, right? Kill them all, start over. Um, and so, you know, that's why in uh, native bird, wild bird populations, the death rates are infinitesimally smaller than they are in commercial poultry operations, okay? And so, all right, so let's talk a little bit about uh, how did the cows get it? How did the cows get the bird flu? And how do people get the bird flu, right? Well, first of all, let me tell you uh, that the incidence in cows is pretty low and the incidence in humans is really, really low. I mean, I'm, if I remember right, there's like 70 cases or something. And in every one of those cases, well, I actually counted them, as I recall, 67 of the 70 people that got this strain of bird flu in this country so far have had intimate, continuous, long-term exposure to infected birds. You know, they're guys that work on chicken farms, you know, and egg-laying facilities. And so, you know, they're getting big exposure. Now, let's talk a little bit about flus. Uh, usually, they're pretty host-specific, like I said before. Uh, they usually stay, tend to stay within their species or their group. You know, bird flus stick to birds. Um, but sometimes they'll mutate. And when they mutate, that makes it so that they can get into another species. Okay, so now the bird can cough on a cow and the cow can get the flu. Or a bird can cough on a human, a completely different mutation. Okay, they have to have a special mutation for every other species they want to mess with. But, but now they can cough on the farmer and make him sick. Now, that doesn't mean that when he goes in to have lunch with his sweetheart and gives her a smooch and says thanks for lunch and goes back to work, that she's going to get the flu from him because that's a second mutation, all right? So there is no human-to-human -human transfer at this point. There's no cow-to-cow -cow transfer at this point. They're all getting it from the birds, all right? And it's all because they have significant exposure to the birds for some reason. Now, um, so... What does that mean? Well, first of all, you don't need to be alarmed that, you know, we're all going to get the bird flu and die unless it mutates again. And then, of course, it'll be like uh, all the other influences that are going around and we'll get them and we'll get sick and we'll have an issue. OK, one of the things we see, incidentally, is that when a new flu gets into a novel population, a, a, a novice population that's never seen it before, you get lots higher infection rates because they don't have any natural immunity to it. They've never seen this bug. Right. And so you can have a pretty quick epidemic pandemic situation if it makes that second mutation. 
I got an example of that. There's a there's a new canine flu, came out several years ago. It started as a horse flu in Asia. Okay, so all the horses at the racetrack were coughing and sneezing and having the flu, right? And they were giving it to each other because they're horses. Um, but all of a sudden, that virus mutated and started getting into the dogs, and so now the dogs that work at horse racetracks or on farms that raise horses, now those dogs are getting the flu. But they weren't spreading it to each other, to other dogs, because that's, a, like I said, a second mutation. Well, guess what? It mutated again. And now the dogs are sneezing on their buddy, who's a dog, and he's getting it too. And what happened was uh, a dog owner from Japan traveled to the United States, to Chicago, to the like biggest dog show in the world in Chicago, and that little dog was infected with a the flu. They didn't know. But that dog had the horse flu, the canine flu, and, you know, sneezed on dogs all over that show, which then went to other shows in other states. And within six months, we had canine flu in every state in the United States. Still do, you know. And so that's how that happens. You know, you have to have mutation number one where I can get from a chicken to a, to a human, and then you have mutation number two where I can get from a human to a human. All right. And so far, this avian flu uh, that we have, this type A H5N1, has not made the second mutation. Okay. Um, so, well, what can we do about it? What, you know, what if you're a homesteader and you've got a flock of chickens? What can you do? Well, chances are if you're a homesteader and you have a flock of chickens, they're living a lot better life than the gals and the commercial flocks are living. Okay. Hopefully, they are. And... and what would that life look like? Let's look at it. Okay, what can you do as a homesteader or a chicken owner? Uh, you know, you got a couple of dozen birds to make eggs for your kids. Uh, good ventilation is key. Good sanitation is key. Uh, not overcrowding is key. Giving those animals access to live pasture. If it's, you know, if it's the time of year you can do that. If there's plants and grass and bugs out there, let those gals go out and scratch around and cluck and squabble and dig up bugs and worms and eat dandelions and whatever they want to eat because that's then they're getting the nutrition that they need, right? They're birds. They're supposed to eat like birds. Um, and so, and if you get some birds that are sick, if you get two birds that are pretty sick, well, you can cull those two, but don't kill the whole flock, right? Let them get through it and get over it and get the immunity. You know, um, so there's also some plants that are wildly effective against the influenza viruses. Uh, and we've done uh, lectures on that, and, and we certainly cover it in a lot of depth in the Homegrown Herbalist School of Botanical Medicine. But, you know, sweet wormwood, uh, garlic, you know, elderberry, echinacea, there's lots of plants that either inhibit the viruses, especially influenzas, mullen leaf, you know, there's a lot of them that either inhibit the virus from entering the cell or some of them inhibit the cell once it's infected from exploding and let it's letting a million virus particles into your body, which is how viruses reproduce, right? They inject their DNA or their RNA into your DNA or RNA and your cell starts making virus particles instead of what he was supposed to make when he got up that morning. And, and then the cell membrane ruptures and... The viruses are spread to other cells, you know, other cells in your lungs or whatever kind of virus it is. Um, anyway, there are lots of herbs that interfere with both of those processes, with the attachment and with the replication. I'll tell you what, I, so I've got a formula called shoe flu, okay? Uh, S-H-O-O-F-L-O-O. -O -O. And, you know, we're not making any claims Go look at the herbs in that formula. Go to homegrownerbalist.net. Look at the herbs in that formula and get some ideas of some plants that have some research that uh, have some antibiotic activity. The other one I like is a, is a formula called immunity support. Okay, And it's got things like astragalus and olive leaf and garlic and echinacea. And all of those plants also have significant inhibitory properties against, you know, for one thing, they stimulate your immunity, which is great, but they also, a lot of them have significant inhibitory Properties against the virus themselves. You know, pine needle does, shaga does. Uh, who else? Sweet wormwood. Fantastic, right? And so there are plants that you can use, and you can feed those to your chickens. You know, in fact, we have a 
a kit uh, on homegrownerless.net. It's called the Livestock Farm, F-A-R-M, Pharmacy Kit. It's just a bucket, and it's got all kinds of herbs and formulas and instructions and bandage material and about anything you could need. Really a good thing to have sitting in the corner of your barn. Uh, so that when something does come up, whether it's a wound or an illness or whatever with your with your livestock, that you can take care of it. Uh, we really do have remarkable tools all around us. Um, go look at some of the other individual plant videos that I've done here on YouTube. Uh, and I did uh, a respiratory webinar, I think, that's here on YouTube. Go look at those and have a look. Um, and if you're really interested, have a look at the Homegrown Herbal School of Botanical Medicine. We talk about all kinds of these things. And you can get a really deep training from a guy who's a clinical herbalist and a veterinarian. So I'm Doc Jones. If you enjoyed the video, click the little like button, subscribe, and I'll send you some more of them. And I hope you'll share it. You know, if you've got people that have chickens or eat chickens or buy eggs or worried about all this stuff, click the share button and let them know that this is here. I'm Doc Jones. Thanks for listening. Hope you have a great day.